On this episode of Between Two Beers, we talk to Matt Heath. Matt is an actor, producer, sports commentator, columnist, musician, and radio host, and can be heard hosting Hodaki's Breakfast Radio Show alongside Jeremy Wells, as well as commentating sport and sex with the Alternative Commentary Collective. In this episode, we talk about Matt's humiliating experience at Laura McGoldrick's wedding, his reflections on playing Danny Parker in Back of the Wine Masterpiece Television, how his fake band Deja Vu got a record contract, the time he made Jackie Brown cry, and the realities of working with Jerry on Breakfast Radio. Seamus and I are both huge fans of Matt's work and loved sharing an hour with him at the ACC headquarters. He's sincere and honest with a ruthlessly funny edge, and we know you'll enjoy this one. This episode was sponsored by no one, but it could be you. If you would like to sponsor an episode or become our official sponsor, get in touch. We'd love to be talking about you right now. Check out our website at betweentwobeers.com where you can find show notes, photos, YouTube clips and links to Spotify and Apple Podcasts for every episode. There are also links on our site to our Patreon page. A huge thanks to those who have already shown their support. Enjoy the episode. Matt Heath, welcome to Between Two Beers. Oh, thanks for having me. We are honoured to have you on board. Uh, Matt's just walked out of four hours of broadcasting <laughs> straight into a long-form <laughs> podcast. So I'm not, I'm not really sure if that's a bit of a punishing situation, but here we are. Let's yeah, well, a- I've had a big weekend in Topol this weekend where I really sort of pushed the boat out. So, you know, when you're broadcasting, sometimes you go to your head and you're just really impressed with your head because it gives you something. Mm. And sometimes you're broadcasting in the bit where your head's going to answer and give you something to say and nothing comes out. And you go, what are you doing, man? This is not how it works. You know, you just talk. Had a bit of that this morning. That's where we are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, like, I'll do my best. So it was a bit of a controversial move. Where between two beers, we often have beers with guests. Uh, yeah. 10 a.m., so bought, <laughs> bought, a six, bought a chili bin filled with ice and a six-pack of beer. Always be prepared. Yeah. Didn't know which way it was going to go. We've, we've opted for the coffees uh, this morning, which is probably, we'll see, the, right, we'll probably the right play, but yeah, it, it is early. Let's, see, yeah. how, let's see, how, see how we go. Shay, get us started. How do you know Matt Heath? You may not remember this, speaking of big nights. <laughs> I came up to you at Laura McGoldrick's wedding. Oh, yes. I was a guest there. Yes. I was sat at a table with the late Sir Martin Crow. Yeah. Shane Bond. Uh, who else was on there? I bombed Gareth Hopkins off. So I was a plus one. Yeah. And a few beers deep, and I just fanboyed the fuck out. <laughs> I think you'd just done a deja voodoo set oh, at the no. reception. See, that was one of the most humiliating things in my life, that. Because <laughs> I had told Laura that, you know, so it's at Graham Hart's house. So yep. it's a, you know, arguably, the, it's a compound more than a house. Billionaire's place. And it's pretty flash. And people were pretty flash. And I, I wasn't very flash. I was in awe of a lot of people there. Yeah, yeah. Jason Gunn was emceeing still. Yeah, okay. that's right. And, and people were wearing really flash suits, not just sort of off the rack, rack sort of numbers I'm turning up in a sort of mm-hmm. Helen Stone. Not everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's maybe why we bonded, um, well, spotted we each other. Um, but then, uh, and so I said to Laura, she goes, oh, we've got to get you to sing your song. And I said, no, no, seriously, it's been a long time. Also, I don't sing that song. And that sort of didn't register for, with her. What was the song? It was Beers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So that's the covers band start playing it, and she, and she comes up and goes, "Come on, get on!" Everyone's going, "Get on stage and sing it!" And I'm like, "Seriously, Laura?" But she didn't. She thought I was being, you know, like overly, you know, I wanted to go on, but I was just being coy, you know. But I was like, "No, I seriously don't want to go on. I've been on the whiskeys. I don't know the words to that song. I didn't sing it. I, I played the guitar." And so before I know it, I'm on stage, and the covers band's not playing the song right. Yeah. And I can't remember the lyrics because I never sung them. And, and I was just standing there and it was just, and every, every other performance had been amazing. Like Laura got up and did incredible disco songs yeah, and was, BG songs. A, yeah. And I was, just, I, like, I was so humiliated. I, was like, no, I, th- I really enjoyed it. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. And then I went and embarrassed myself with Jeremy as well around eating media lunch. And yeah. my partner at the time was just, just not, did not want to know me. So that's how I've met is you. That, I've met you right, the first time Is that time a bit now. of a theme for you? Nights out, weddings, pubs, whatever guys coming up to you thinking they know you wanting to have these sort of drunken I, I like it I, like, I, I love talking to people you, when, when there's been a few beers and you go out and, and have a ch- you know have a chat especially in a situation like that because I didn't know too many people so it's, it's good if there's a reason for you people to come up and talk to you you know rather than me I, otherwise I would have probably been punishing 
Martin Crow or something, you know. Like. <laughs> there's just different. <laughs> there's just different levels of punishing. Eh? Shay's yeah. punishing up to you. Yeah. You're punishing up. To I was Crow. punishing up a lot that night. <laughs> a lot. You punished a lot higher than me. <laughs> um, and Steve, you've had interactions with Jeremy and Matt before. Yeah, I don't know if you remember. I was I, I did the Kipchoge. Yeah, thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a few uh, was it the start of the year? Yeah, yeah. Came so on the show. Came on the show and yeah. did this sort of trying to run one kilometer yeah, at the yeah, same yeah. pace. Was that this year or last year? That was this year. This yeah. was in February. March. Yeah, it feels like a long time ago. So I was deep in because I've been deep into. Running. I think I was talking about you the time running. I was just starting my running, and I've been running every day um, since then. And nice. I was building up to do the marathon in November, but then I forgot. I'm useless with calendars, and I'd been booked to MC the craft beer and food festival in Dunedin. Oh, and nice. So I had all my training worked out, and then it was like then something popped up on my phone, and my flights were to Dunedin. I was like, oh, that's right, I've signed up for that. So I've been feeling guilty about not running that marathon. Yeah. But also slightly relieved. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I imagine Breakfast Radio is just a blur of interviews and guests and talking to people you don't know. You're, you're mm. quickly sort of shuffling around. Being in studio gave me a little glimpse. You know, it seems like having a breakfast show with one of your best mates, Jerry, would be like the dream job, which mm. it, I'm sure it is. It's, it's good. But there's actually a lot of admin that goes yeah. on in between the voice breaks, and it's constantly thinking about what's coming next. And I imagine it's quite an intense four hours by the end. It is, because you also got a lot of sponsorship, things that you can't say the wrong word on, or else we lose a lot of money, and it ruins people's lives <laughs> that work in the sort of other areas of the company. So you got to get some things right, and, and also... You know, like, this is great because you just get to talk in a row for a bunch of time. Yeah. But, you know, in radio, you're talking three-minute bits. And so you have to start the break, then you go on a journey, and then you've got to end it. And, and it, the break's terrible if it doesn't end with a good line. And hence today, I had, normally I can come up with an okay line at the end of a break, but my brain wasn't delivering them. <laughs> so it's kind of relentless. It's just boom, boom, boom. Because it's not really natural. And I find myself, actually, you might have experienced this when – um, I ran into you. I, I tend up to, to, to talk in three minute breaks. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, blah, 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 blah. And then I'll say something. It's like, well, this isn't over. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing? We're not going to an air break. We're not playing a song here. <laughs> you know? Yeah. We, we spoke to, we had Mike Lane on the podcast oh, yeah. um, a few weeks ago. Great and we New sort Zealand. of talked about Great New Zealand, the ACC, and how yeah. that seems like the dream job. You've kind of got best of both worlds because you got that and then you've got. I mean, I was listening on the way up, you and Jerry. It's it's very relaxed. It's you. It's just talking shit with your mate, yeah. but it's appealing to so many people. Yeah. The only downside is the insanely early starts, right? Like, what times your alarm going off? Yeah, uh, my alarm goes off at five in the morning. Back in the day when we first started, we were like, you know, uh, didn't really know how to do radio. Not saying that we do now, but it was we would do a lot more prep. Super super early yeah. stuff. Yeah. So so now we um we sort of like this morning because we'd had that massive weekend in. Topora like came in, um, you know, we're doing seconds before we go in here. Like the, you know, the, the theme music's playing, and I'm walking in. Um, but yeah, so the alarm goes off at five o'clock, and that's fine though, because you just cal- calibrate your life to that, you know. Yeah. And and when I first started in breakfast radio, I had young kids, so I was getting out of the house for that annoying start of the day. You know? Uh, I know, you know? well. So yeah. so <laughs> so I'm off to earn some money, so you can deal with the kids in the morning. Kind of thing wasn't so bad, but um, yeah. And then it's just been a long time now, so I don't really even. Think about it. And it actually helps because, you know, I enjoy a drink and it's sort of, if you've been up since five, you don't necessarily go till 3 a.m., yeah. you know? Yeah. You face down on the table earlier than everyone else. Keeps how, a bit of a lid. On how, did, um, yeah. how did this morning compare to the all-night session with Laura and Jeremy a few years ago? Oh, jeez, those ones, eh? Yeah. Were we a bit clearer today than you yeah. were at that time? Oh, there was one time, eh, when my, my I'd lost my voice. Yeah, and I was just going, Yeah, you look good, Laura. <laughs> Jeez, you look good, Lord. Which is not fine at a pub when, and it's particularly not fine being broadcast. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that was a good time. That, I mean, that, I, back, I back that. Yeah, that that was insane. That listening to that, listening to you progressively get <laughs> looser and looser, seeing if you could still pull it together. I mean, it was it was like car crash radio. You couldn't stop <laughs> listening, you know. But it was so entertaining. That was one of the. Yeah. You, is that is that going to happen again? I don't know. It's I think there's time now, isn't things, it? Things have changed a little bit. Like, but I don't know whether whether that could happen, um, or whether I'd want it to happen. I don't know. I'm in mean, this kind of interesting stage now, where like one of my sons is quite old, and some of his kids listen, and some of his mates listen. Not some of my sons. Well, wow, some of your sons' kids. Wow, <laughs> yeah, he's not Very that dead. old. Um, so I don't know. It's like I, I am slightly aware of. Very slightly aware of not totally humiliating him, but um, then again, I do it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think he's he's all right with it. 
Well, well let, let's get into the backstory mm. of Matt Heath. Yeah. Um, your son and his friends can learn perhaps a, a thing or two. Yeah. Uh, the place we want to start, Balls of Steel UK. Oh, yeah. And I've been tipped off that um, this was perhaps your best time you've had on set. There's a few <laughs> yarns about, I think, hot mics and, and talking about directors oh, and Jesus. producers. Who told you that one? Oh, that was horrific. Yeah. Oh, that one. So, um, the <laughs> so you know, we did uh, Back of the Wire in New Zealand, and um, some guys at MTV over in England, just some British guys, came across it, and they sort of rang us up and said, um, we really want to make a British version of Back of the Wire. So they flew us over there, and so we were, you know, and they put us up in accommodation, and and we were negotiating the TV show, getting it ready, and all that kind of stuff, and getting paid money. And we were there for like six months, but then a new American producer came in and saw what we wanted to do, and was like, "No freaking way, that's not going to be on MTV, um, that's not happening." So it all got cancelled, and so then we flew back to New Zealand, and then like about a year later, the same guys rang up and said, "Hey, we're at Channel Four now. We're making the show called Balls of Steel. We want to get you back over." So they flew over, us over, and we started working. On that, and, and so they, they shot a pilot for it. So we flew over just for the pilot, and then we, we flew back to see if it was going to get picked up. And there was this director that was a real knob. Like the guys that we were actually working with that were from Birmingham, and they were great dudes, great dudes. But then they brought in this kind of – there's a kind of type of guy in England that's just a real kind of posh asshole mm. <laughs> um, that just thinks you're a piece of shit. And anyway, we were mic'd up, and we didn't – and we were like, fuck, we're going to have some beers around the corner. I can't handle ha hanging out with this director telling us how to do what we're going to do. And so we went around the corner and we, we cracked open these beers and, and we were e eating some pizza and stuff. And I was just going, that guy is such a fucking asshole. <laughs> Jesus, fucking Christ is really laying into every part of him. His shoes, his hair, every bit of him and, and a dick. And then, and, and then I, came, I thought I'd better go. I'm about to do some more shooting. They're setting up the next shot. I came around the corner to go to the bathroom and then on a big speaker... There was Chris and the other guys still going oh, on, man. and everyone was standing around <laughs> listening to us. And the, the, the guy's just like shaking his head at me as I went round, and I was like, "Oh, this isn't going to go well." Wow! And it didn't really. We were jumping. We were jumping some piranhas. So, so the, the <laughs> idea was like we're. Um, so the idea was Randy Campbell was going to jump over these piranhas, and so we got real piranhas because we finally had a budget. Like the thing is, wow. Back of the Y, if you'd watched it, was kind of funny because it was shit and everything was shot small and it wasn't trying to be big. Yeah. But when we went to England, they were like, oh, so it's they kind of up the budget. And then when you're up the budget, why aren't you jumping Grand Canyon? You know what I mean? Why are you on a BMX bike right. and, and with all these big cameras and cameras up towers and, and um, you know, cranes and all this kind of stuff? It just kind of didn't translate. It was better shooting on a crappy camera because it was a parody of that kind of thing. Right. Um, and, and so... <laughs> So we've got this huge setup, and then the prawn, the not the prawns, the um, you're still in piranha, the uh, prawn park, yeah, still at the prawn park. <laughs> um, the 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 well, they're not piranhas, aren't actually that aggressive, no, they're not. They're, and and so they were just scared. The, the, and there was a guy saying, "Be quiet around the piranhas because you'll scare them." <laughs> and the, all these piranhas were just hovering in the side of this pool. What sort of number of piranhas are we talking? We're talking about ten, S size 15. of the school. 10 or 15 piranha just hiding terrified in the corner of this thing. We're about to jump over them. Um, so anyway, that didn't turn out. I think well, like, well, the show got picked up and we were, we were hired for it, so it must have turned out vaguely okay. Yeah, yeah. you're good. It wasn't our best. It wasn't your best, but mm. memorable time on set. Yeah, it was cool. Um, all right, let's, let's go right back to the start. Because yeah. the, the back of the why, beginning, I understand it was you and, uh, was it Chris? Uh, Chris Stapp, yeah. Chris Stapp. Yeah, and, and Phil Bruff and, went, and went a few others. Went to school together and started sort of... Yeah, Chris, Chris, Chris was above me in school, so I didn't really, you know, at school, people don't really talk to people lower, lower, lower than them. But somehow, I don't know. Oh, that's right, yeah. So Chris came up to me uh, after, you know, when we were first year of varsity, and he said he knew I played guitar. And I was a reasonably good guitar player. And they'd said that they wanted to have a girl in their band, and but they couldn't find a girl. Right. So he's like, "Oh, we, we, he was like, I want to wanted to get a girl in, in my band, but you've got pretty girly here, so you want to be in my band?" <laughs> yeah. And I was like, "Yeah, I want to be in your band. Sounds bloody good." So then I joined his band, and then and around that we just started shooting like dumb gags. It was sort of based around um, uh, skateboarding and and shooting, you know, jumps off certain things and. And um, and then we just started putting on dumb costumes and then making up dumb stories and gags and entering this competition called the Mothra Film Festival at Tug University where you'd win an award for best cover or you know for, for your what you're handing in, um, best stunt, you know. So we just went through and tried to win every award: best costume, best stunt, best joke, all this stuff. 
Um, and so that sort of became back of the way, really, just flicking, ticking off all those boxes. And did then, did and you do drama and stuff at school, high nah, school? or Nothing like that, eh? Like, absolutely nothing like that. And, and I think you get, if you see the movie The Devil Tell Me Too, you can probably see that we didn't do a lot of acting training. Um, some of the worst acting that's ever been put on film. <laughs> um, but, um, but uh, yeah, so, so it was weird. Like, that's why we ended up doing all that kind of stuff. I'm not sure. But we just found it really funny. And, and we just sort of started, like, um, handing around copies of it. And it sort of got around. And then we, when we moved up to Auckland, we started doing it on Triangle TV up here. Mm. Um, just making the first seasons of Back of the Wire were just um, on community television. Mm. Um, oh, we should have mentioned at the start, we're both big fans. I mean, Shay was you were hugely influenced by Back of the Wire growing up. I, I, yeah, I, I was. I'm, I'm a couple of years older than Steve, so maybe <coughs> I'm the Chris Stape to, to yeah. the Matt Heath over yeah. there. But I remember stumbling across it, you know, after ten o'clock on a weekday and thinking, "What the fuck <laughs> am I watching here?" And it was awesome, but it was sort of like, I've heard you talk about this before. It's sort of like, it was smarter than what it was pitched at. Yeah. Like if you got it, you got it. Yeah. And then I've I've also kind of done some research and seen that you're influenced by the young ones and stuff like yeah, that, yeah, which yeah. I was as well. Yeah. And it was it was amazing. It was like someone had snuck into the studio and like <laughs> pop popped the video in of this thing and been like, fuck, I hope no one no yeah, one yeah, no one yeah. knows this goes on. Yeah, that that's funny you say that because it sort of got two levels of fans. There's the people that liked it just purely because it was pretty retarded. Um and then there was the people that saw that we were doing sort of a parody of that. Kind of, but kind yeah, I don't know. It was whatever made us laugh, you know, yeah. like, like, um, so like when we're filming it, like we do like a parody of, um, like Vaseline Warriors, for example, we'll spend like weeks shooting a parody, stupid parody of like, a, you know, a post apocalyptic movie or something like that. It, it didn't really make sense. It's like you've got the set, then why, why is that happening? It was just everything we felt like doing. Um, so some people, Be- some people got well. that, yeah, some people got that and some people didn't. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, what? Some people were just like, what? Like someone called the police, like, <laughs> You know, you have broadcasting standards complaints. Um, someone just called the police. They woke up. They've gone to sleep on the couch. <laughs> they woke up. <laughs> and they're like, they rang 111 <laughs> and complained. The TVNZ were telling us, someone has called the police on the show. <laughs> we're like, well, it kind of makes sense. For those listening who don't haven't heard or seen Back of the Why, to describe it, I don't know, It's it's got to be like, the crudest, like perhaps most <laughs> controversial show that's ever come close to being on yeah. TVNZ. Yeah, right? well, there were questions asked in Parliament about it. It was it was quite full on. Um, but the weird thing is, like we did, we were we were really stoked to be on TVNZ. It wasn't like we were anarchists trying to smash things down. We were big fans of TV, so it was kind of like we'd come into the building to burn it down. But really, we were like you know really stoked to be there. Yeah. <laughs> but we were just too well, South didn't Islandy. You, didn't you elect to film outside of any sort of TVNZ property? Yeah, we kind of thought that because we didn't have any health and safety at all, and we were jumping cars through sets, and like we were flipping cars on the on the road and, and acting like total bugs. Um, and you can't really do that. Like we d- we did some stuff within a TVNZ studio later on, and the health and safety, we just wanted to drive a car through the set, and it's like, well, you can't. Um, but so we we got a um, we got our own little warehouse on Twenty Eight Hill Street, Onihanga, and um, and we could just do anything there, you know, and and it was great because I remember once we. We flipped this car because we had this stunt that Randy Campbell was going to do. We ha- he screwed up all his stunts, so he just needed to drive ten meters in a straight line. <laughs> I remember this without messing it up. <laughs> and he hits a bunch of rubbish, and he flips over, <laughs> and it smashed the car to pieces. And then we're in the middle of a street, so we just had everyone ready to sweep up all the glass, whip the car over, whip it in, and pull the, you know, pull the um thing down before the police come. Yeah. And then the police are sort of cruising past going, and there's like nothing to see here, and we're all staring out the windows. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we just flipped the car on a main street. What sort of crew do you pull together to, to get that going? Because there was only four of you in front of camera, right? Yeah. I felt like you guys did everything, filmed it, edited yeah, it. Yeah, we did. We, we did. We had um, some people behind. There wasn't too many people just strictly behind cra- camera. Because um, when it started off, it was like um, me, often the shoots would be, on, when it was on community television, it would be me and Chris interviewing each other and they'd, we'd have the camera on a tripod and we'd just turn it on. So there was only, and you know, we'd do that. But we always had like, um, I'm still in the company with the guy that played Spanners Watson. Um, retarded South Island Mechanics. Yeah, Retarded Spanners South Island Mechanics, Spanners Watson. Um, we've got a, an animation company, motion graphics company together. So we still work together. So he was there all along and there was a guy called Matt Perkins that was there and, and, and Grubby and Chris and um, yeah, a bunch of people. But you're sort of mates, you know, and you'd write people in, you know, when you're like young, you can, people don't have anything to do. Yeah. Like if, trying to write people in now, 
people have got kids, they've got stuff. They're not just going to spend an entire Sunday doing your stupid shoot for you. <laughs> but the show, I, I've sort of gone back and forth on this. Like the show couldn't exist as it was now. Like no. it, was, it was partly stunts. Yeah. But it was partly like the most insanely filthy. <laughs> I, I remember I was looking back through some YouTube clips um, over the last couple of days in prep for this. Yeah. And the one I stumbled across was uh, New Zealand's most loved TV personally, Danny Parker. Oh, yeah. Walking down the street asking people to eat his shit and drink his oh, piss yeah, yeah, for yeah, $5. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then someone finally does it and he doesn't pay him and then you end up beating him up. I'm like, that is a premise for a joke. <laughs> and then it, like, it finishes by saying, and for my next stunt or whatever, um, I'm going to find a prostitute and uh, see if she'll uh, give me a blowjob and if she does, I'll give her $50. <laughs> you know, like, is the, are you writing these jokes thinking... Is this? Are we actually going to make this? Like this, well, this, this is insane. That was actually a parody of you know Mike Whitney, who's yeah. de- who dares win. So it was, yeah. a, it was a low level parody of that. <laughs> like, if you'll drink my piss, because he used to go to a mall and there'd be big dares, and there'd be ones where he'd just offer people little things to do things. So, I don't know. We just thought it'd be funny, <laughs> and and it was one thing that we used to always say. Like, I used to imitate Mike Mike Whitney a lot. And we'd go around and do it, and I'd go, I'll give you five bucks. If you... So that came out of just a joke that we'd do all the time. Like, we'd go, I'll eat my piss, and eat, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'll give you five bucks. Because there was one where he's like, it's easy going down the rapids, but these wheel pools. <laughs> I, was, I find it really amusing. So a lot of those were gags amongst, amongst mates that then yeah. turned, into, um, turned into skits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Are you writing most of it? Is it you and Chris doing all the writing for the jokes? Yeah, yeah. So we'd write the scripts, um, and yeah, yeah. It, it's the yeah. I guess it was me and Chris writing them. Some of them weren't really; they were just sort of basic ideas. Yeah. Like um, a lot of the constable ones were written. <laughs> you know, they would be written up and and that kind of thing. But that would be like just me going to that one was just me sort of going to a mall and then and then like at the end I thought that'd be funny if we go to K Road and then I say that joke that, that was just like sort of at the end there, there was no bit of paper for that one you know yeah, 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 yeah. there was no script you talk about being friends on that show how, how does it how do you as a friend think I'm going to get in a car and I'm going to drive this into my mate now like are you shitting yourself before you do that sort of stuff or are you just yeah well Chris is an amazing st- he was an amazing stuntman so he and so I get in a Are way. Are you an amazing stunt driver? No, um, <laughs> and yeah, that was that was kind of the thing, wasn't it? it? Was because he seemed kind of invincible for a while. So like the speed when I was driving into him would get higher and higher. And there was one when it just got, I'd, I'd lost, I hit him not hard enough, and he couldn't go over the top. And he sort of gave me some stick. He's like, "What the fuck am I supposed to do with that? You coming at me at thirty k? What the fuck?" He gave me shit. So I was like, "Okay, I'm gonna freaking all right, mate." And so I came at him really fast. And he just hit, and like, like you know, he had shoes that were done up, right? And if you try and kick a shoe off, you know, it's not going to come off. But his shoes came flying off when I hit him. I thought, this is interesting. And then his head just smashed into the windscreen instead of rolling over the top. And then we rushed him to hospital, and he had like spinal, they said, you've got spinal fluid coming out your nose. And I was like, yeah, I probably hit him too hard there. And, then, and that's when I sort of started to think, he's not invincible, mm-hmm. you know. But he still thought he was invincible, so it was, it, was, it was fine. But all that kind of stuff, there was no health and safety at all. And, and, and we were lucky that no one got re- – there's so many situations where it was really close to someone getting really badly injured, you know. Um, and, you got, you, and you wouldn't even know it happened. Like someone would be riding on a car, and there was one where I was driving a car around. Um, it was in like a warehouse, and there was um, beams, you know, like – and um, someone – people were supposed to hold on, and then they'd fall off at one point. And then I, I sort of skid around, and, and one of our dudes, Grubby, came flying off at high speed off the back of the car, and his head just goes past, and just there's a beam here, and his head just goes right past the beam there, and he, and he keeps rolling. That's not very good description on a podcast. <laughs> anyway, it was really if, his close. Head, if his head had hit the beam, he'd have been, uh, that would have been freaking serious. Yeah. I mean, at another point, he would end up going through a glass table. And I was like, other people would have had fake glass tables, but he was just going through a glass table, jumping off this thing, and he got... It looked like a great white, a great white shark had been munching on his butt by the time we got him to hospital. Did did, did anything? Did you ever have to like can filming for a little while while people recovered, or you yeah. just kind of sometimes, yeah, yeah, patched up and get back in the pitch? Yeah, but there was sort of sort of kind of weird, eh? Like you weren't really allowed to say you didn't want to do something, and you weren't allowed to. There was kind of sort of a sort of macho ness about it, so you couldn't really say that you were hurt, and you couldn't really. Say that you didn't want to do something. It was kind of, it was kind of weird. Like Don't that. take this the wrong way. It's quite hard to picture that talking to you yeah. now. Yeah, like yeah. Like that fearless Matt Heath way back oh, when. Boy, I'm so fearful now. 
Like, man, since when you have kids, everything freaking changes, you know? Everything changes. You're like, Jesus Christ, someone's gone through all that effort to, to, to bring you up or bring someone else up. It's like, you know, there's quite a lot of effort that goes into a kid. Is that why it finished? It sort of reached its natural conclusion? You kind of grew out of it, you had kids, all the rest of it? Or did it yeah. just it didn't have any more I think, reason I think we went to, it sort of reached its natural conclusion because we went to London, we were there for quite a long time, and we didn't really produce much because... It didn't really come off. And then we got the offer to make the film. So we came back here and made the film. And then after we'd shot, spent, it took a long time to make that film. And after that, it was a bit like, and then, we, I don't know. Yeah, just things changed. And, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of like it was, it was sort of giggy. It was giggy. So you'd have a bit of work and then not much work. And yeah, actually, now I think about it, then I had a kid. And then I was like, actually, you know, I have to feed this thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I can't just be going around the world and shooting six episodes of a show in a year and, and you know, having a bit of money. You have to have cons- consistent money coming in. So yeah, it was probably me that peeled off and so was went, there, went to radio or something. Was there ever a point where it was like a full time, like a stable, consistent job? And you're thinking that this is kind of going to be my career doing um, stuff like yeah, this? Yeah, it was because we were doing lots of other stuff around it as well. Like, uh, so, you know, we'd been shooting music videos for people as well that might not have been back of the YE and working in TV. I was working as a television producer for real, real shows as well. So th- there was sort of a um, job part of it, I guess. But I don't know we always thought we were just going to go bigger and bigger and bigger and then make a really good film. And then we made our film and it was and they're good. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, okay. <laughs> it's interesting. Like, I've heard you talk about it a lot and it's kind of self depreciating, but it is such a cultural. For people around our age, it's yeah. such a cultural icon of New Zealand kind of television and entertainment. Yeah. The back of the Y stuff and also rolling into the Deja Voodoo stuff as well for those that uh, <laughs> yeah. tuned well, that, in. Well, that was interesting because Deja Voodoo started getting a lot of – we ended up touring a lot with Deja Voodoo and that was really weird because it kind of wasn't really a real band. <laughs> and there'd be times when I'd be like playing a gig somewhere and there'd be a crowd there and and um, and we were going through like actual band problems and like, like there'd be arguments – and that's like, and then I'd have to realize this isn't a real fucking band. Like, what's going on here? Like, it doesn't matter if no one likes us tonight. It doesn't matter what our next career move is, you know. And like, we signed to an Australian record company, and we're flying over the air, and we were doing all these things. And I was like, hang, hang, this doesn't make sense. Like, this. So, <laughs> so for listeners who aren't aware, Deja Voodoo were formed to be a band in Back of the Y and do little like what yeah. ten second little instrumental kind of yeah, lead-ins. that's right. And so, so we played all the we played the music because we me, me and Chris used to play the music that was on Back of the Y. We'd record it. Um, although the riff dun, 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 that was um, actually played by another band of ours called the Warlocks of Firetop Mountain and um, and uh, Matt Perkins was in that band so we'd always been in bands and so the name Deja Voodoo just came up once to be the band on Back of the Wire it's like oh they're called Deja Voodoo yeah. I don't, I, someone had seen a covers band called Deja Voodoo because I think a lot of covers bands in the world are called it's like Deja Vu but Deja Voodoo it's got, it's got a little bit more so um, so we um, uh called the band that and then um then we got a record deal it was quite interesting yeah so how did that progress to well we'd always writing been writing it wasn't like we became musicians for it some people thought that we'd always been in bands <laughs> yeah they right. just didn't no one had bothered watching them okay <laughs> you know for for good reason so one of our tipsters has suggested that you signed big with the aussie promoter michael gudinski oh yeah, and yeah. the band still owes him money their oh, money oh <laughs> we owe a lot on our um record contract because it didn't in in Australia because it pl- uh, back the way I played in Australia on a channel called uh, I feel like it's called it was Channel V or something in Australia like it was sort of like a music channel over there kind of like at at C four or or a Max TV or something which was quite big at the time and so I played over there but it didn't really have the same it didn't have anywhere near the same cultural impact over there um, so I think we sold about one probably one CD single over there um, with quite a sizable investment <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you were signed at the same time as Betcha Dupa yeah we're, we're signed to the same label which is yeah. Liam Finn yeah um, that's right yeah so so but it was cool because we got over there Michael Ganinsky's crazy man he's great had some great times with him over there and um we were flying over there but in my head I was like this isn't you know I knew that it wasn't going to work yeah because I don't know like what are you telling me I smoked pee and I'm all right <laughs> didn't, didn't translate to the Aussie market I was talking to someone whose first job was to take that to radio he said you know my first job is because you know the, those people that pitch songs to radio and he goes to me this is about six months ago he goes, you know what my first fucking job was I was, I was when you guys who, 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 who I'm not sure EMI or Universal or something that were distributing our stuff through liberation um yeah and he said I had to take that to you know 
radio stations, probably Radio Hodaki, and say, would you play something like I Smoke Pee and I'm All Right? You, yeah, we're sure we're going to put that on a high rate, mate. <laughs> yeah, hell yeah, it's number one. When, when you look back now and reflect on Deja Voodoo and Back of the Wire, what do you think? Are you filled with pride about that part of your life? Or? Yeah, like, because it was really what it was, was a social group. It was a group of friends, so it was always funny. It's like we used to write down the ideas we had when we were drinking and actually make them. I think every social group has probably good gags or goodish gags that they think are great. But we shot them. That's what we always thought. We'd go and film them. And so the next day with a hangover, like I remember we came up with Bottle Store Galactica. That's what it was. It wasn't Beer Wars. It was Bottle Store Oh, yeah, Bottle Store Galactica. And so we like had that idea when we were steamed and we laughed for so long at it. And then we couldn't remember it for like four weeks. It was like we had a great idea. And then I found a bit of paper that I'd written. Somewhere it was like beside my bed or something. It said just... Bottle store Galactica. I was like, yes. <laughs> and so then we're filming it. We've got sets. We've got, it. and it's like really not really worth all the effort they put into it. Yeah. yeah. It was that was the appeal though. The appeal mm. was Gorilla TV. It was yeah. It was great. It really was. And I, you look back at it now, you kind of cringe a little bit back at it now. But the, yeah. the gags still stand up. It's yeah. still good stuff. It was shot so terribly. Like but that's the appeal. Yeah, 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 yeah. And as I said before, it's like when it was actually shot really well, it didn't quite translate. Yeah. Like when we made the movie. It looked too good. It needed to look. It would have probably been better if we'd shot the movie like we'd shot everything else because it, it, it's if you shoot it good, the joke that it's crap isn't quite good. It's just crap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the although um, some people love that movie, it's you know like every, every week someone comes up and goes, ah, oh, I love that movie. It's my favorite movie. But we, me and Jer- me and um, me and Jerry, me and Chris, we were like because it did quite well in Germany and it did quite well in Europe. Um, ended up making quite a lot of money that movie, but. Um, we went to a lot of film festivals and we'd have to introduce it and then we'd seen it so many times. At one point, we were sitting in this film festival, we just we had a few drinks and we started booing our own movie. We were so sick. <laughs> we're like, it's rubbish! <laughs> where, it off! where can uh, listeners view this movie now? Is it on any of the streaming platforms? It was, on, it was on Netflix for a while in America, maybe over there. Mm. Uh. I saw a trailer, there was a YouTube trailer mm. for yeah. a minute. It was all I could find. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, Keep you, we'll keep you posted between yeah, two beers, listeners. Uh, it, it sold a few <laughs> copies on DVD. Um, it was called Dick in America, not The Devil Did Me Too. Yeah. So it was called Dick. Yeah. And it, had, it was funny because in New Zealand, the cover had a picture of um, Jerry on the cover. I mean, not Jerry, fuck. Chris, talking about my current um, person I've just been talking to for four hours. Um, Chris was on the front cover of the DVD in New Zealand and America. It was They changed the name of the movie and put a picture of me on the front cover. Good. <laughs> I was like, you're not good enough for the States, mate. It's gonna, it's, and they, even though I... I you know, was definitely the secondary character in the movie. Just to finish off the back of the why stuff, mm. um, when we had Mike Lane on, we talked a lot about the ACC. And for yeah. any listeners who are tuned into this one, go back and listen to that because we cover it in great detail. Yeah, We spoke about how when Lee Hart sort of went on the field at the World Cup yeah. and it pushed the ACC yeah. into the mainstream and then they kind of took off from there. Yeah. Did you have a similar-ish kind of incident with Bill Ralston, like Hammer in Back of the Wire? Yeah, that's right. So before it was originally supposed to come out, they sent out like preview copies of it to all the reviewers, and he saw it and he said, this is the worst thing ever. <laughs> and he was so furious. So he just kept on writing article after article for weeks, like for four weeks in a row, just writing, this is big. And like back then, right, in a newspaper, that meant something, you know, because they wanted the reviews. Um, and this before it's gone to air. Before it's gone to air. So, and so they Great pull it. Publicity. They pull it. TVNZ pulls it before it goes to air, and then there's all these articles that it's been pulled, and and then it was pulled, and there was all this kind of problems, and then it um, wasn't going to play. But then the minister of broadcasting, who I think was who was it, someone can't remember her name now, but she for some reason championed it, and she rang up and she said to TVNZ, you, "They've made the show because it didn't, co- it wasn't New Zealand Air funded, it was it was, it was v-, v funded. Yeah, that's yeah. right." So we used to have this thing. It's like we don't want any of your bloody New Zealand air money. You know, V pay, paid for this, and V just—I don't know. Back in those days, V just gave us a whack of cash to make a show because they we did these things called Arts Hole on um, Space. So good. That was um, that was uh, sponsored by V, and then V just said, "Oh, we'll we'll, we'll pay for your whole TV show." And I'm like, "Wow, that's fucking amazing!" There was actually another sponsor that paid quite a lot of money, but when they saw it, they didn't want to be involved. With it. They said, <laughs> "We can't take the money back, but do not ever mention us in any way." Really? To the, yeah, yeah. And it was really funny because. I was watching it with them. I took them into the office to put it on, and I put it on. And I, but it was the sun was a certain way, so I could just see their faces behind me, just like there was this couple of it's like a scene from a movie. There was a couple of ladies just sitting there going, <laughs> they were furious. And then and then they didn't really talk to me when I left. And then and then I got a call saying we're, we're not going to ask for the money back, but 
we do not want to be mentioned ever again in any way associated with this show. Wow. <laughs> it um, says a lot about a person, their reaction to Back of the Wild, doesn't it? Because you were appealing to like the teenage munters and the bogans and that sort of crowd. But we also had some sort of intellectual, like Steve Braunius was a fan. Yeah, he was a huge fan of it, yeah. You know, guys who were sort of a little bit upper brow. Yeah, yeah I feel like I fell into that category. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I did, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was, eh? And there was people could see that it was sort of a statement on um, on TV, uh, you know, in a way. Like, it was it was sort of commenting on things. Like, some of this stuff was political satire, like when we had um, the constables shooting golfers. Oh, <laughs> oh, that was good. You know, that was talking about that incident where um, the, the, the guy was smashing up cars with um, golf clubs and then the cops shot him. <laughs> so there was there was some stuff there. Uh, <laughs> mixed, get, mixed in with a little bit of drinking piss and but I remember meeting Steve <laughs> Braunius and, and, and it was funny because we were just bogues from Dunedin and no one knew who we were really at all and then it, and then Back of the Way came out and it doesn't make sense to people now but if you were on broadcast TV back there it, like, a lot of people saw it and from one day from you know is anyone going to watch it to it came out the first night like it changed everything and like, it sounds stupid, but we were getting invited to things and we'd just been absolute South Island pieces of crap. And suddenly we invited a thing. One of the things I was invited to Steve Brawny's book, book launch, which is quite a fun. <laughs> and I was like, I'm drinking wine at a book launch. So you went, so, oh, so, great. So, <laughs> basically shat my pants on TV and I'm, <laughs> and I'm at this thing. And then Steve Brawny, and I'd, I'd heard about him because, you know, back then he was, you know, he's even more so now, but back then he was still a well-known guy and he came up and he was just, talking so intellectually about how great our show was. Yeah. And then someone came up to, to us at that thing and said, I saw your show last night. Have you heard of timing? I mean, time, comedy and timings, everything. And Chris was really drunk and he came up and said, pushed the guy and said, timings for faggot. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, we, we, we actually need to get out of this. We can't say that. We can't say that, Chris. Yeah, 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 we can't say Offside, show offside. Oh yeah, when you, oh, I think yeah. you were working on it, and and you were banned from Jade Stadium. For, oh yeah, yeah. So um, I was brought in to write a few gags for a sports show, and the first gag I wrote is I thought it'd be funny if we went round and we, I think we were interviewing Norm Berryman and a couple of the other Crusaders, and we I thought like when they were talking about stuff, we cut in other stuff. So they pointing, they were t- taking us through the thing, and then like you know like. This, you know, this is how we hydrate. And it cut to like a bunch of bottles of tequila. <laughs> you know, it's just really simple gags. And then like over here, you know, like we've been doing a bit of research and they just piled up a bunch of porn mags, but we <laughs> shot it in a different changing room. So I just thought that was kind of funny. And I thought that's what I'd been sort of hired to do. And then, you know, like there was, there was just a bunch of gags like that, which I actually thought was quite a funny piece because he was walking around and he was so sincere. Like it's hard to get people to be that deadpan yeah. because it was actually a really boring piece of footage. And... <laughs> But we shot it too good, and and um, the Crusaders organisation um, thought that we were trying to. I don't know. I mean, you can't really do that with New Zealand rugby. You, uh, and then we just banned. So we're doing a. Uh, <laughs> so after the first episode, the show was banned from Jade Stadium for the, for the rest of its run, <laughs> based on your joke. Based on my joke, and <laughs> which, so was, was, which was a precursor to Family Guy stuff. Cutaway gags. <laughs> yeah, it was cutaway. It was. It was. It wasn't much. But um, Steve Chu took exception, and and I can kind of see it now because people because people do believe what they see. Mm. I was like, like <laughs> one time I was like um, doing a radio show on BFM. I used to do a Thursday show on BFM. I first got into radio, and I made up this news story that um, Sigourney Reaver had changed her name to Super Horny Beaver, <laughs> 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 and it's a stupid joke. But Paul Cassidy, who you know wrote Eighty Meter Lunch. He was driving over the Harbour Bridge listening to it and he was going, has she? <laughs> and I was thinking, you've done more pranks on the world than anyone and even you for a second believe what people say because we're used to believing what people say because why would someone just make something stupid up? I mean, it is even as stupid as that. So, Super horny beaver. Like, yeah. how, how are you thinking that that's a possibility I said, I said, that it's actually I, happened? I, I said it was for a charity thing. She's doing it for one day. She's going to change her name to Super oh, horny beaver for one day. Amazing. Super horny beaver. It's amazing. Good on her. It's for, I don't know what it was for. Um, and it was just a stupid gag, but that's the thing. So I guess with this Norm Berryman thing, you're like, um, people don't know that it's not, not true. Yeah, yeah. Because they're like, well, why would you film it then? Yeah. <laughs> why are you saying that's happening if it's not? Like, yeah. that's a good question. You know, especially on a sports show as well. Yeah. You, you've named, um, name dropped Eating Media Lunch there. Yeah. Am I right in thinking you've had a hand in a lot of 
kind of those sorts of shows. Did you work on that one as well as an I editor? Did, I did a bit of editing for Eating Media Lunch, and we and we we made like that song. Uh, I smoke pee and I'm all right. That was uh, for a, a, That was for Eating Media Lunch. Mm-hmm. So because they because is it after the guy cut yeah. the hands off? Yeah, no, it was a bit after that, but it was yeah. <laughs> Anton Dixon, was yeah, Anton right? Dixon. There's a line in that song about that, but um, but I remember I was talking to Jeremy and Paul Cassidy at a party once, and we were talking about why is there no positive peace stories? <laughs> 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 like and that, like Paul Cassidy was like like these bit like, of PR. like someone was trying to rob my house, and then my um pee, <laughs> my pee lab exploded, so so he was set on fire. So yeah, it was thank God for the pee lab, you know, it stopped him <laughs> stealing my TV, you know. And so he, he decided they decided to write a skit on um, positive peace stories, and we were like, "Oh, we'll write you a positive peace song." So then at the end, you can go and a band. <laughs> and if you actually listened to the lyrics of "I smoke pee and I'm alright," I was trying to say it was lame, like I smoke pee and nothing happened, mm. you know, like yeah. because when we, we we were that was based on like me and Chris had been over in England for a while, failing to make a TV show because we keep on getting cancelled. Um, and I was flying back into New Zealand. I hadn't really zoned into New Zealand much. And on the plane, I just picked up a Herald, and it was just all about dog attacks and pee. And I didn't really know what pee was, because yeah. it was must be early on. And when they were calling it pee, I was like, "What the frick is pee?" It's like this, the whole country's being attacked by dogs, and there's pee. <laughs> and then when I got back, I said to someone, and they're like, "Oh, it's meth." And I was like, "Oh God, it's meth, right? Well, that's fucking grim." <laughs> Pop sport is that on your list of, of I, I, credits I, as well? I, I would um, we'd peer on that a lot, but you know, just in their gags, I think. Um, Ben and um, Jamie were fans of um, Back of the White to a certain extent, so they'd get us into a skit every season, pretty much. But just we were just doing their lines on it. You know, we didn't really contribute anything there. I love I love that guys, and I, I love those guys, and I love that show. So we're always happy to help them out. You know, for um, if they ever wanted to do anything. Your so your star was still quite strong after Back of the Wild. You're a bit of a minor celebrity. I don't know if you call yourself that <laughs> potentially with a certain <laughs> certain C, certain uh, B or C grade. Yeah. Um, was there any any offers for you to front or be part of other sort of TV shows? Yeah, yeah, I got quite a lot of that, particularly me, but I was kind of, I had imposter syndrome in the point that, because I was parodying being something, so I couldn't actually be something, you know what I mean? That was my my problem for a long time. Right. I was like, no, I can't actually do it. I can pretend to do it. But if you ask me to come and do something, if there was one situation when I was at the um, Big Day Out and, and, uh, they came up to talk to me on the camera and, you know, so they said, oh, we meet you here and you just talk about how your day's going and stuff, like do some little bit of presenting. And I had a Heineken in my hand and I thought, and, but I also had my cap in my hand. So I was like, oh, it's a bit sunny. I'll put my cap on my head. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I poured the whole beer down my face and this was live on TV. And, and I thought I've got to hold it here and pretend like it was a really good gag and I put it back. And then um, and everyone's like, that was fucking funny how you did that. It was brilliant. You know, like, you know, always on. I was like, actually, I forgot that I had my Heineken in my head. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that was about the extent of my uh, doing it. But then I did a, quite, I did a bit of that sort of stuff. And, um, yeah, I kind of enjoyed it. But, yeah, it was hard. as I say, it was a group of mates. So it was hard for us to go outside of that group of mates and do different things. It was kind of like we all did everything together. Yeah. You know? You're obviously Breakfast Radio now. Mm-hmm. Mm. After that all sort of finished and you didn't find another project, mm. did you think that radio was, did you start gravitating towards that as a career? Uh, no, I didn't really mean to because I'd started just producing real shows, you know, and being in the background and, and writing and doing that kind of thing that were like, um, you know, to make money and was enjoying doing that. But I also had this Thursday drive show on BFM and I never meant to do that. I was like, um, they just rang me up and said, do you, you want to do a radio show on BFM? And I was like, yep. So me and Chris started doing that. And um, which was just us getting steamed, really, and and yeah, talking for hours. Um, and so I sort of was doing radio, but never really intentionally. Quite enjoyed it. And then they offered me the breakfast show on my own without Chris on BFM. Um, and then I did that for like seven months. And then Hodaki rang me up and said, "Do you want to have the drive show on Radio Hodaki?" And I was like, "Wow, this radio career is really <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I've gone from just this being drunk on Thursday nights to being offered like a nationwide drive show." Is that Mike Lane calling you up at the time? No, it? that was way back. Um, that was before Mike Lane. So he's been the boss for about five years. Oh, f- so the ACC blew up so so big that they gave Hodaki to uh, Mike Lane. They're like, "If you can do that with just a iHeart Radio stream, then we'll put you on in charge of." Hodaki, so he's only been the boss of Hodaki for about three years. Right. Um, and the ACC's been around for about five years. 
And so it was It was this guy called um, Mike Regal Ridge, who's a legend in the radio industry. In fact, when I was a kid, I remember being on 4XO in Dunedin. But, um, and so, you know, he, he, he um, rang me up, and, and I think Ian Stables was supposed to do it, but he'd been involved in an incident and got fired. Shock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so they rang me up and, and did that. And then in, in speaking, about, speaking of imposter syndrome, I was really open with them. I was like, I can't. I don't know how to do a commercial radio show, just so you know. And they're like, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll help you through it. Um, and then I remember just like probably one of the most nervous, the most nervous I've ever been in my life was on the first day I was about to go live to you know, 19 markets across the country. And you know, even though I've been quite clear I didn't know how to do the job, I still felt like an imposter. Was and it was, just you? It was just me. It was the Matt Heath Drive Show on Radio Hodaki. So it was like the Matt Heath Drive Show on Radio Hodaki. It had my name on it. I wasn't, and I was so used to working in a pack. Um, that I was hanging out on the own, and, and then they put me with Tim Bat, um, who's a comedian these days, and he's a, he's a good man. Have um, you got a tattoo of him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Well, the he's, commercial he's, revealing, he's revealing his shoulder tattoo. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. You also nearly killed him with a T-shirt. Can yeah, you? that's right. Yeah, I still bring a bit of the back of the Y styles. <laughs> um, and that's the other thing with the back of the Y thing. It's like outside of the bubble, in the back of the Y bubble, you would just fire someone, shoot someone in the throat with a T-shirt can, and no one could complain. But and it was just a bit different. You can't really do that to people. Like, and there was other things where I'd got acting jobs, and there'd be like a scene, and I'd just beat the shit out of the person because that's how we did it. We always had this rule: you couldn't fake a punch. Anyway, uh, yeah, the most nervous I've ever been was coming in to do that radio show, and then I got through the first radio show, and I was like, "This is all right, okay, I've got through the radio show." And then someone just rang up and threatened to kill me. <laughs> it was like, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait outside the fucking building. I'm gonna fucking kill you. You should have no right to be on radio." I was like. Yeah, he's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's right. I got nearly got through, but yeah. And then many years later, I'm still here and I and love it. Like I love doing radio. It's great. Yeah. So, so the move to link up with Jerry is that is that like a, a phone call coming through? You're like, this is dream move. In the morning. With, were you mates with Jerry at the time? Yeah. So me and Jerry decided to because we'd been mates for years. Like um, we'd sort of met because um, through TV stuff. You know, he'd I think he came up to me and um, said he liked the show or whatever. And so we we became friends. And um, you know, not great friends like the reason why I used to be in the ACC because I met Jerry and I was a massive cricket fan and so we just started texting each other during cricket games you know like you know in different places and whenever we ran into each other at a bar we'd always end up having a good time together I remember what, like the second time I ever ran into him we were just happened to be at like a uh, karaoke club and he was there and he 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 said I'm doing we are the world were you <laughs> are you interested in coming up I was like, fuck yeah. <laughs> and we both knew all the parts of We Are The World with all the different voices. Wow. And and we did a, a, a like a duet right the way through. And then <laughs> and then we just started saying we changed lives that day. We changed lives. <laughs> and um, I ended up going back to his house with a bunch of people and we got on the, on the, on the steam and, and just continued singing We Are The World. So it's sort of, the relationship had, had, had sort of grown up naturally. And then um, and then Jerry came over to do a show on Hodaki as well. I said, we should get Jerry to do something. And Mike McClung was a fan of Jerry's who was one of the bosses then as well. And um. And so Jerry started doing the Saturday show. Um, this, he did this show called The Saturday Special with Steve Simpson. And then um, me and Jerry just talking. It's like, we, we both said we'd like to do the breakfast show. So we came together and, and, and made a pitch yeah. to, do, to be the breakfast show. And they took it. Now, what are you, three, four years in? Five? Five. Five, five years in, yeah. yeah. Does it feel comfortable? You, you said you, at the start, like, we um, used to do so much prep for shows. You yeah. know, before, now it's kind of like... As you do with any job, you get a bit more comfortable, and you kind of yeah. just you get in there and you feel confident enough to just yeah. You wing can it. pull you can pull something off, you know. Like mm -hmm. in the in the past, like we used to talk about when we first started, because I was still green when we started doing commercial radio. I was still green from the Matt and uh, from the Matt Heath Drive show, so I was getting there, you know. Um, and then um, we we talk about this thing like it'd be like a minute before the end of the song, and you you put your headphones on and you prepare for the minute before the end of the song. You're like. <laughs> counting down <laughs> thinking about what you're going to say yeah. and now it's like the song's finished and Jerry's just telling the time and I'll put my headphones on and then uh, you know like you, you can do it but we, we yeah. prep now by text so like we've got a text thread and any idea we have we just fire it through and we've got great producer Banger who um, just works out the show so it's a well oiled machine now and it's, um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's good I've lost the imposter syndrome One of the reasons that you guys are so appealing is because it seems like you are able to pretty much say whatever you want without mm -hmm. fear of getting cancelled or <laughs> losing your job or, or any of that sort of thing, which is why the ACC is so successful. Yeah. Um, I was reading something you wrote about sometimes, you, like in your columns and things, you write about drinking a lot yeah. for a bit of a reaction, Yeah. saying that a lot of people, the way that they talk publicly and privately is quite different, and you're kind of just like bringing that out. Yeah. Um, we've had some criticism on Between Two Beers for perhaps not 
being ourselves enough and not really pushing the boundaries and giving some of our real opinions. Not cutting yeah. the shit. Not cutting the shit. Yeah. And I guess as you develop, you get more comfortable doing that. But is there any sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, way that you're trying to protect yourself now as you get older? Is there a line for Matt Heath that there wasn't before? Um, I think there probably is. Um, I don't know. Like, And, and also I was just talking to, um, just to drop some other names, John and Ben about it before, and it's like, now you can do anything. It's not as funny to do it. And I was actually reading um, Howard Stern was talking about this, and he, he you know, because he used to do shocking stuff when he was on broadcast radio, right? And it was shocking. And then when he went to um, Sirius or whatever, and he could do whatever he wanted because it was internet radio. His his thing was, well, now I can do it. It's not as funny. Mm. And so over the years, you know, the standards I guess have slipped to the point where it's not. It used to just be funny to be shocking, mm. but it's not. It's not as exciting or anything anymore. Like, say, take Back of the Wild. That was full on. And part of the reason why it was so funny, it was so shocking for the time. Mm. And so that from what you expected to get, it was so totally different. But, you know, like the whole shock jock thing, and it's like if you come in and you say something shocking on the radio, it's not. It's actually standard, you know, yeah, yeah. to a certain extent. And it's actually harder to actually be, and this sounds like such a freaking cliche, but to be honest and be yourself and to actually... And, and we're stupid and we don't do it all the time, but to actually have an honest opinion on something is quite hard to do. Mm. It, and, and when you do, because you're always hiding behind a sort of, you know, like if, it's, if you're being ironic, you can hide behind it. You're not really saying anything. Mm. But um, I think people in radio, because you're there day in and day out, and the bits they really like is when you actually reveal a little bit of who you are if you can. Yeah. Um, you, you also reveal a lot. You're a column writer for The Herald. Yeah. One a week for 50 odd weeks. For been doing it for about four or five years now, that's a lot of opinions. Yeah, how hard is it? I mean, I, I work with sports reporters. You know, even the sports columnists. Yeah, you're doing one a column a week. Shit, they come every week. Shit, what am I going to write about? What am yeah. I going to write about? How hard? How hard is it to continually get that flow of? It's pretty hard actually. Um, and not like I took a break recently uh, from it um, for a couple of weeks. Uh, but it depends how low level you're willing to go for your idea. Like this week, I was writing about how. Um, my grandmother used to say pant instead of pants. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, why? And then I started thinking about it. It's like, well, did there used to be <laughs> pants? Because the pants is one thing, but it's kind of two things. And so is glasses and so is scissors. And so that's what I'm writing about. So <laughs> you can have an idea. Uh, but then I played it into the sort of wider thing about um, search, like in, in, you know, searching things up to have a go at Google. But um, the thing is, uh, there used to be two pantaloons. So you put one, you put a pant on. And then they were strapped together in the middle. So it's like, people say, put your pant on and then put your other pant on. Oh. And then when they were connected, people were like, oh, they're pants now. Because there's two of them. Oh, so I see what you've got. You've got your pants on because you've got two of them. You know? So the answer to the question, if you're willing to write about that, then you can find a yeah, problem. Yeah. Well, not, not blowing smoke up your ass. Like, I really enjoy your, your opinion. Like the piece about the um, female doctor versus the male doctor oh, yeah. with the hemorrhoids. Yeah, yeah. So true. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you read something that's actually true, it resonates far more than if you're reading just fluff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. If you're willing to do that, yeah, if you can, it's, it, you just, you're just sort of beholden to something happening to you every week. <laughs> like, I was hit by a car recently on the way to work. I was riding my bike to work and I got hit by a car and before I hit the ground, I thought, me and Jerry have this joke about casual chat. I said, and before I hit the ground, I thought this would be a good casual chat on the radio. <laughs> Bang, hit the ground. <laughs> my first thought was, I'll write a column on this. I'll talk about it on the radio. You know, it'll be on the, a story on the ACC going forward. I'm going to get a lot of, yeah. Yeah, get a lot of content out of this <laughs> potentially uh, fatal accident. Yeah. It's, it's amazing the number of strings you've got to your bow, right? You've got the, Back of the wires type stuff and the stunts and the and the gags. You got your breakfast radio. You're doing your column. You're in deja vu. You also won best kids TV show at uh, yeah. last year's TV awards for Fire in Cardboard City. Yeah, that's you're right. Appealing yeah. to the kids as well. You're, yeah, you're yeah. Ticking off all demographics. Well, if you take out the um, really offensive stuff, most of the jokes on Back of the Wire were kind of childish. So, <laughs> me and um, Spanners Watson, uh, Phil Bruff, who's the guy that we've had an animation company together for years, like Finewood Animation. We mainly do ads and stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, we we started making this in the spare time because it's quite punishing just doing ads all the time. We so we decided to make a short film. So we made and and me and him were just thinking once like, kind of what's the worst thing that could happen? And we're thinking like if you're in all cardboard city and there was a fire and you were the fire department in an all cardboard city where everything's made out of cardboard, that would be that would be the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> so that was the premise. It's the worst thing that could happen. So we made a short film and it did really really well around the world. Won lots of short film festivals. Got lots of big ups from people 
um, Matt, Tr- Matt, Matt Stone and Trey Parker loved it, and they they flew Phil. I couldn't go, but they flew Phil business class to New York to to talk about it um, last year. Um, and so it just blow up. Um, I think they mainly like it because our cardboard can turn on the side, whereas their cardboard can't. So this was more of a technical like. It's like, how do you turn the cardboard on the side? And we're like, yeah, yeah. Did Phil get a chance to sneak any back of the Y stuff in for <laughs> Matt and Trey? He didn't actually. He should have. He should have flipped them a, a, a the DVD. Know, DVD, yeah. Um, and they'd be like, how do you play this? But um, and so, but it did really well. And then um, and then we got back here and we just committed. Got, turned into a TV series and now we're developing it as a sort of adult TV series out of Australia. The company over there actually got a going back and forth on the legals of that. So if this sorts out, it's always complex, but um, yeah, we're surely t- turning into a 22 minute sort of, sort of more adult kind of um, cartoon based in the same world. Okay. Um, but yeah, welcome to Cupboard City. You watch it on TV and Z on demand. It's yeah. Four seasons now. You won the award. I understand there was a, a minor incident with yeah. Hillary Barry's <sighs> husband. Yeah. I've got this thing where I can turn um, wins into losses <laughs> by celebrating the win. I, I celebrate wins so much that they become a loss. And I celebrated that win so hard that I celebrated all the night, <laughs> punished Hillary, Hillary Barry and her husband for a while, and then kept punishing all through the night and then turned up on the radio and then and was still steamed, still talking absolute crap. And then um, ACC and Haidaki head G-Lane was like, get off the radio. <laughs> what are you? Speaking about celebrating wins, your, yeah. your son Barry... Yeah, Baz. Yeah, budding celebrity reporter. <laughs> yeah, so he's he's reported. He's been flying overseas to interview. Oh, who's he done? He's done Chris Pratt. He's done. Uh, in fact, I went to like so that he went to 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 uh, L.A. on and then um, on the back of that, um, the film company got him to fly him to New York to to interview a bunch of people over there, and I went along as his support person, and so he was playing for my flight. So we. You know, flying over um, nice seats to to uh, New York, and we were staying in this hotel right on on Central Park South. It was just beautiful, and you know, I I, I said to them, "Look, we're going to have to be there four days before the interviews and four days afterwards to justify us <laughs> traveling all that way." So then I was just I was basically over there on the dime of my son, and we were both getting like um, you know, one hundred and fifty dollars American per day a day. <laughs> nice, <laughs> and it was all on my nine year old, ten year old son. Um, running it to do these interviews, but he's really he, he's really good at doing uh, interviewing people. Um, he's strange. Kids these days are really ridiculously confident. Um, I think schools just build up their confidence. Right when I went to school, it was all about smashing your confidence down. Mm. But, but now it's a, and so they they do they're fine to speak publicly. They're, everything it's kind of like Americans. When, you know when you see see Americans kids on TV, you'd be like, how can they talk to the TV? Because we'd be staring at our shoes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so it's it, it's it's good. Um, he's, he's, he's done quite a few of those now it's great worst time on set this was written in one of those Q&A things a while ago you made Jackie Brown cry uh, uh, <laughs> during yeah. a late night TV show Space yeah that's right I was working on <laughs> <laughs> so we're doing so that, that was before we had back we were, I was, had back of the way on um, it was on Triangle TV at that point and we were doing these art soul things on, on um, a show called Space and um, so they were just arts reports, but we'd be, we, we eventually changed it to Coming to Your Hole, which was a parody of um, Havoc and Newsboy traveling around the country. So, so this is actually probably before I knew Jerry was, I was sort of ripping the shit out of him, but um, that wasn't a full wage. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was like, I'll be the runner as well, you know, because then I can get like, you know, 700 bucks a week or whatever <laughs> yeah. on top of the, you know, 500 you make. <laughs> and, then, and, that, and that's for a guy from Dunedin, that was a lot of money. Um, and then, um, and so, but I always thought I was better than everyone else because, you know, I thought Outbit's the best part of the show, whether that was true or not. I don't know. But, um, and then, so I was supposed to get Jackie the uh, filet of fish. And just before she went out, she had an argument with me about the <laughs> how, how much money it was. And like she wanted more change, I was like, "You fuck off with fucking getting more change." I fucking pocketed the change. You know, well, I'm not giving you the change. And so I was the runner, and I made the star of the show cry over change for the food that I was getting paid to go and get them because Amazing. I wasn't going to give the money back. Amazing. Yeah. It's a, it's a co- career low. <laughs> yeah, career, career low. Low. Well, I didn't realize it was a career low till about two years later. I was thinking back, and I go, "Where the fuck did I think I was?" <laughs> She's lovely. She's always so lovely to me, and but I just wasn't willing to, you know, negotiate around a dollar fifteen change. 
Gold. Well, Shay, how's your list looking? We're making it towards the end. I know Matt's been uh, chatting away at broadcasting for about the last 20 <laughs> hours and after a big weekend in Topol. Uh, anything else we, we need to quickly get checked off the list? No, I'll just thank you. I don't have kids myself, but yep. I did want to thank you uh, for you and G Lane's commentary on childbirth. Um, oh. <laughs> on, on the agenda podcast the other week, it was enlightening for me and uh, helped me understand my uh, my father friends a little bit more. So thank you for that. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. Wide ranging um, sports chat. Yeah, yeah. Now, thanks so much, Matt. Um, you're a busy man. We really appreciate taking the time. Oh, no, thank you for talking to me. It's been fun. And um, yeah, um, good on you guys doing this podcast. It's great. Uh, the, the long form kind of chats are great, man. It's the way to go. As I say in radio, you get someone and talk to three minutes. You you don't really get to um, have as many punishing stories as I've just shared with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure the audience will have loved that. Yep. Thanks very much. All right.